Uh, good evening, everyone. We'd like to begin uh, the evening, if we could. My name is Father James Mason, the President Rector at Kenrick Glennon Seminary, and welcome uh, for tonight's presentation. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us. Open our hearts, our minds to hear your voice, to know your will, to discern your truth in this world. We ask you to pour forth your spirit upon our speaker, Dr. Barr. May we hear him with open ears in the glory of creation. Lord, that you are in, in everything and you are with us this evening. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ed Hogan forward to give the introduction. Thank you, Father Mason. My name is Ed Hogan. I have the honor of being the academic dean at Kenrick Glennon Seminary. Before we begin, I want to mention that tomorrow is the feast of St. Albert the Great, patron saint of science and scientists. In honor of the day, our friends and collaborators at ITEST, the Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, are sponsoring a free webinar from noon until 3 o'clock on the topic, Is Evolution Catholic? And I placed brochures for that conference on the back table if you'd like to attend. If you can't attend, but you'd like to learn that stuff, it will also be archived at the iTest website. Also, in honor of the day, St. Louis will be holding its first ever gold mass, honoring the role of science and scientists in the church. Mass is here at 5 p.m., and I have those uh, uh, notes in front. Consider yourself invited. We are coming at Kenrick Glennon Seminary to the end of 18 months of work on a $75,000 Science for Seminaries grant from the Association for the, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, helping us to integrate science more deeply into our curriculum. We thank the John Templeton Foundation and everyone at AAAS for that grant, and I thank everyone here at Kenrick Glennon Seminary who helped us secure and execute that grant. I can think of no better way to place the capstone on the work of that grant than, than, than with this lecturer and the gold mass tomorrow. Dr. Steve Barr has a PhD in theoretical particle physics from Princeton. He is currently professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Delaware, where he is also director of the Bartol Research Institute. In addition to his work in physics, Dr. Barr is a superb philosopher, and as you will discover tonight, a capable historian. In addition to that, he has done such distinguished service to the church that he was awarded the Benamorenti Medal by Pope Benedict XVI in 2007, an award which is given by the Pope for outstanding service to the Catholic Church. In addition to that, he is such a good theologian that he was elected to the Academy of Catholic Theology in 2010. In addition to that, he is such a creative organizer that he co-founded and is founding president of the Society of Catholic Scientists, which began in 2016 and has over a thousand members in 38 countries today. And Dr. Barr thinks it could and should have more like two or 3,000 members. Admittedly, Dr. Barr is not a first generation scholar in the dialogue of science and theology. That honor belongs to the likes of Ian Barber and Arthur Peacock and John Polkinghorne, who helped to define what the field looks like today. But if he came after them and stands on their shoulders, it is also true that he has seen farther and deeper than them. In my estimation, and I wrote my dissertation on one of those first-generation scholars. He stands to them as St. Thomas Aquinas stands to St. Albert the Great. He is very simply a giant in the field. Please welcome Dr. Steve Barr. Thank you, Ed, for that introduction. 
I'm a little awed. <laughs> I hope I can live up to it. Thank you for all coming out uh, this evening to hear me. Um, can you hear me OK? Am I oh, good? Uh, how many of you, I'm sure everybody recognizes Einstein, but how many people recognize the clerical gentleman standing with Einstein? Uh, raise your hands. OK, good. So s most of you will at least learn one thing tonight from my talk. So many people think, let me uh, just check that this works. It does. Many people think there's some kind of a conflict between religion and science. I'm sure that most of you are aware of this, and some of you are probably here tonight for that reason. Now, when people find out that I am a scientist and a religious believer, they sometimes ask me whether I have any difficulty reconciling those two things. Now, I've always found that a strange question, and I think a lot of religious scientists do. The same thing that makes me a Catholic Christian, or some of the same things, make me a scientist a sense of wonder, a passionate desire to know the truth about things and to know the reason behind things, and a deep conviction that everything holds together in some coherent way. So for me, both the Catholic faith and science make sense of the world. Science tells us about the things that we can observe and measure, but our faith has a much wider scope and answers deeper questions. Questions about the ultimate cause of the world's existence and order. Questions about the purpose of human life and our ultimate destiny. Questions about good and evil. About God and man, love and truth, sin and redemption. So the Christian faith and empirical science are indeed two different perspectives on the world. They see things in different ways, but not conflicting ways. Now, I've been a scientist for about 41 years, at least since I got my doctorate, and I've been a Catholic for about 66 years. I turn 66 in a few weeks. And I know of no scientific fact that conflicts with any Catholic teaching or Catholic doctrine. So why do so many people think that there is some kind of a conflict between science and religion? Well, there are many reasons, and one is that some people lump all religion together in an undifferentiated mass. So any example they come across of superstitious beliefs or magical thinking, they, uh, is, to them the, is evidence of the irrationality of all religion. And many fail to see the distinction between science itself and a certain philosophy or even ideology that is based on science called scientific materialism, though it goes by other names as well. What is scientific materialism? Scientific materialism, also sometimes called physicalism, is the idea that all reality is reducible to matter and its behavior. Scientific materialists are people who think that modern science somehow implies the truth of materialism. Now this is an opinion that's held by many scientists and by even more people who claim to speak in the name of science or are influenced by science, but it has no claim to being science. It is, as I said, a philosophical opinion. Now, if matter were the only reality, then obviously God would not exist. So scientific materialists are also atheists. And many scientists who are atheists are materialists, in fact, most of them. But not only would God not exist, but if matter is the only reality, there's a sense in which you don't exist either, not as you thought you did. You would be nothing, a human being, would be nothing but a complex structure made of atoms. And everything about the human being could be understood ultimately in terms of the laws of physics that govern how those atoms move. So the popular astronomer, Carl Sagan, 
of a, he was the Neil deGrasse Tyson of a previous generation. He once said or wrote, I am a collection of water, calcium, and organic molecules called Carl Sagan. And Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, wrote, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. So that's, that's what we're up against. We're not, we're not just up against atheism. Atheists are actually just say that God doesn't exist. Scientific materialism is much more radical than that. It says nothing but matter exists. Now, for some of its adherents, scientific atheism or scientific materialism is more than just a philosophy, a philosophical opinion. It's a passionately held anti-religious ideology that sees science as having a saving mission. And that mission is to free the human mind from superstition and irrationality in all its forms. And they count religion as an example of irrationality and superstition. So for such people, it's not enough that science is a good thing and brings us an understanding of the world. It, there must be an enemy to be vanquished. And they cast religion and religious people in that role. So this explains, I think, the strange zeal that some atheists, like Richard Dawkins, for example, have for propagating their ideas. They feel that they're taking part in a grand struggle between reason and its enemies. Now, scientific atheists and materialists have a, a well-developed critique of religion that has at least three aspects to it. Well, there's a philosophical, a historical, and a scientific aspect. Their philosophical claim is that there is an inherent contradiction between the scientific and religious outlooks. Aside from anything science may have discovered, the very outlook of science clashes with that of religion because science is based on reason and evidence. Religion is based upon, is irrational because it's based on belief in things which are, cannot be seen and for which supposedly there's no evidence. Science is based on natural explanations of natural phenomena, based on natural laws, where religion is based on miracles and the supernatural. So they see religion as a matter of myth and magic, and therefore the very antithesis of a rational scientific outlook. Their historical claim is that religious believers and institutions have been hostile to science and have tried to suppress it over the centuries. And this is powerfully symbolized for many people by the treatment of Galileo by the authorities in the Catholic Church 400 years ago. And this impression is constantly being reinforced in the public mind by the never-ending battles against evolution by fundamentalist Christians. So that brings us to the third strain, the scientific or, uh, claim, claims of the atheists, which is, uh, which is that the actual discoveries of modern science uh, over the last 400 years or since Copernicus have systematically debunked or undermined basic Christian beliefs about the universe and our place in it. So as the story is often told, science has dealt one blow after another to the religious conception of the world. Copernicus showed that humanity is not at the center of the universe. Newtonian physics showed that nature has no purposes or goals, but is governed by blind, impersonal laws. Modern astronomy 
showed how small and insignificant we are compared to the universe as a whole. Darwin, some say, showed that human life is just an accident and that human beings differ only in degree, but not in any fundamental way, from lower animals. Advances in neuroscience and artificial intelligence are thought by many to be demonstrating that the supposed soul is nothing but the workings of a complex biochemical computer, our brain. And modern cosmology is invoked to show either that the universe had no beginning or that the universe created itself out of nothing by a quantum fluctuation. So in this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on the historical, the philosophical and historical critique of religion, though at the end I'm going to say something about some of the things that modern physics has actually learned about the world. So, and, say, and, and I'm going to argue that those very important discoveries of the 20th century actually sit better with a, uh, a religious picture of the world and our place in it than they do with atheism or materialism. So let's begin with a supposed opposition between the supernaturalism of religion and the naturalism of science. Christianity and Judaism were never based on supernaturalism, if you mean by that, a denial that there is a natural order. In fact, scholars tell us that the book of Genesis was in part a, an attack, a polemic, against the supernaturalism and superstition of ancient pagan religion. So when Genesis said that the moon and the sun were merely lamps placed by God in the heavens as lights for the night and the day, it was attacking paganism in which the sun and the moon were worshipped as gods. When Genesis said that man is made in the image of God and is to exercise dominion over other creatures, the animals, Genesis was, among other things, counteracting the paganism in which human beings bowed down to animals or to gods made in the image of animals. So in paganism, the world was governed by capricious deities and, and populated by gods and goddesses of the oceans, of the forests, of fire and lightning and wind, of sex and fertility and so on. The world was filled with occult and supernatural forces and beings. But Jews and Christians taught that there was only one God who's not to be found within the forces of nature or within nature, but, out, but who is outside of nature, who is, in fact, the author of nature. In this way, biblical religion stripped the physical universe of divinity and made it into a natural world. It's a world no longer the abode of gods, but the creation of the one God. And since God is good, the world he created must be good and worth studying. And since God is intelligent and wise, the world must reflect this. It must therefore have been made according to principles and laws that can be discovered and understood by reason. So biblical religion taught that there is a natural order and it comes from God. What characterizes this natural order and reflects the rationality of its creator is precisely that it is orderly, harmonious, and lawful. So consider this passage from the letter of Clement, St. Clement, to the church in Corinth written around 97 AD. So St. Clement, as you know, was the bishop of Rome, a bishop of Rome, and listed in ancient documents as the third pope after St. Peter. The heavens, Clement writes, the heavens, as they revolve beneath his government, do so in quiet submission to him. 
The day and the night run the course he has laid down for them. Sun, moon, and the starry choirs roll on in harmony at his command, none swerving from his appointed orbit. Laws of the same kind sustain the fathomless deeps of the abyss and the untold regions of the netherworld. The impassable ocean and all the worlds that lie beyond it are themselves ruled by like or the like ordinances of the Lord. Upon all of these, the great architect and Lord of the universe has enjoined peace and harmony. Or consider this passage from the Latin Christian author and apologist Minucius Felix writing around 200 AD. In a work, it was addressed to those who did not believe in a creator God. If upon entering some home, you saw that everything there was well tended, neat and decorative, you would believe that some master was in charge of it and that he was himself much superior to those good things. So too in the home of this world, when you see providence, order, and law in the heavens and on earth, believe that there is a Lord and author of the universe more beautiful than the stars themselves and the various parts of the whole world. Now look at what these passages, and I have many others actually on slides and we can, that I'm not going to present unless somebody asks me. Um, well, look what they point to as evidence of God. It is not to supernatural phenomena or miraculous departures from the order of nature. It is the order of nature itself and its lawfulness. The ancient argument was, if there is a law, there must be a lawgiver. God was the lawgiver not only to Israel, but to the cosmos itself. So God says in Jeremiah 33, 25, when I have no covenant with day and night and have given no laws to heaven and earth, then too will I reject the descendants of Jacob and of my servant David. Psalm 148 tells of God establishing the sun, the moon, the stars, and the heavens by a decree or a law. The idea of God as rational lawgiver very likely helped give birth to the very idea that there are laws of nature. And at times, some atheists concede this. So, for example, the eminent biologist Edward O. Wilson, the founder of sociobiology, suggested the following as the reason the Chinese civilization for all of its impressive scientific achievements did not produce, produce a Newton or a Descartes. He said, Chinese scholars had abandoned the idea of a supreme being with personal and creative properties. No rational author of nature existed in their universe. Consequently, the objects they meticulously described did not follow universal principles. In the absence of a compelling need for the notion of general laws, thoughts in the mind of God, so to speak, little or no search was made for them. And the well-known cosmologist and particle physicist, Andre Linde, who is an atheist, has suggested that the notion of a universe governed by, quote, a single law in all its parts is historically rooted in monotheism. Now, we, of course, we believe that there are supernatural realities. Our faith teaches us that. And that some, these have real effects in the world. For example, divine grace. But the word supernatural, which means above the natural, would make no sense unless there were a natural order to begin with. And the concept of miracles, which are extraordinary events that go beyond what is naturally possible, presupposes that there is a natural order that determines what is naturally possible and what isn't. There's no logical contradiction between believing in miracles and believing in a lawful universe. For if, if the laws of the universe 
are those of a lawgiver, God. The lawgiver can always suspend or make exceptions to his own laws. And as we'll see, and he will do, and it makes sense that the lawgiver might do that, might override or suspend those laws for a great enough purpose, for some important enough reason. And that reason for Christians is the salvation of souls, ultimately. That's the reason for the miracles in which we believe as Christians. Now, as we'll see, the, the people who led the development of modern science in its first few centuries, such as Isaac Newton, were virtually all devout Christians who believed in miracles. The, the very people who discovered, first discovered and uncovered nature's laws believed in miracles. Now, there's a lot of confusion today, even among religious believers, unfortunately, about how nature relates to God. Instead of seeing God as the author of nature, they see God and nature as somehow opposed or in competition. So that if something has a natural explanation, then God had nothing to do with it. And if God is the cause of something, then it must be supernatural. So the people who have this view look for God, for evidence of God, only in what is outside the course of nature and what is naturally inexplicable. Something, that is, they look for God in the gaps in our scientific understanding of the world. Hence the expression, God of the gaps. And atheists believe that as the gaps in our scientific understanding diminish, that God will be left with nowhere to hide. The traditional Christian view is completely different, however. If God, as creator of the natural world, established its laws and gave to things their natural powers, then his existence is evident in nature itself and its ordinary processes. This is the message of the following passage from the Book of Wisdom, a Jewish work of about 100 BC or 50 BC, which as Catholics we believe to be part of the canon of the Old Testament. Oh, this is the misconception I was just talking about. It is God versus nature. So the Book of Wisdom, and this passage from the Book of Wisdom is in a sense, the, I think, really the only passage in scripture which is addressed to scientists. Now, the scientists in question were the Greek philosopher scientists, the physikoi of ancient Greece. It says, for all people who are ignorant of God, for, for all people who are ignorant of God were foolish by nature, and they were unable from the good things that are seen to know the one who exists, nor did they recognize the artisan while paying heed to his works. But they supposed that either fire or wind or swift air or the circle of the stars or turbulent water or the lights of the heavens in the heavens were the gods that rule the world. If through delight in the beauty of these things, people assumed them to be gods, let them know how much better than these is their Lord. For the author of beauty created them. And if people were amazed at their power and working, let them first perceive from them how much more powerful is the one who formed him, formed them. For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. Now I can't resist going on to the next, the next few verses because the author of Book of Wisdom shows a certain soft spot for scientists. He says, and yet, these people are little to be blamed, for perhaps they go astray while searching, while seeking God and desiring to find him. For while they live among his works, they keep searching, and they trust in what they see. 
because the things that are seen are beautiful. Yet again, not even they are to be excused. For if they had the power to know so much that they could investigate the world, how did they fail to find sooner the Lord of these things? A question I've often asked myself about my scientific colleagues. But I, though I love that, those verses, the point of quoting the Book of Wisdom was the preceding verses, where the author is pointing to evidence of God. And what does he point to? Fire, wind, swift air, the circle of the stars, turbulent water, the lights in the heavens, all perfectly natural phenomena. So that's what scripture points to as evidence of the creator. Well, let's not go ahead of ourselves. Now, medieval theologians distinguish two ways in which God acts in the world. He can act directly in a supernatural manner, as, for example, turning water into wine, or he can accomplish his will through the operation of natural causes and processes, which in the terminology of theology are called secondary causes. It has always been the Christian view that God ordinarily acts in the latter way, through natural processes and causes. In the words of the scholastic theologian Francisco Suarez, God does not, who lived about 400 years ago, God does not interfere directly with the natural order where secondary causes are sufficient to produce the desired effect. Now this principle was important for the founding of science, for it implied that when confronted by some puzzling event or new phenomenon, we should look first for natural explanations. Superstitious people tend to see the supernatural in every unusual or strange event. But this was criticized by the great medieval scientist and philosopher, theologian, Nicolas Oresme, who was also the Bishop of Lisieux in France. In explaining the marvels of nature, he said, quote, there is no reason to take recourse to the heavens or to demons or to our glorious God, as if he would produce these effects directly, any more than he directly produces those effects whose natural causes we believe are well known to us. Another great medieval scientist and philosopher, Jean Buridan, wrote, the philosophers, which in those days included what we would call scientists, the philosophers explain such marvels by appropriate natural causes. But common folk, not knowing of causes, believe these phenomena are produced by a miracle of God, which is usually not true, unquote. In other words, we should first seek appropriate natural causes rather than jumping to the conclusion that something is a miracle. That's why the Catholic Church in its canonization procedures does not declare a miracle to be worthy of belief unless it has first excluded the likelihood of natural explanation. Now, this brings us back to the crucial theological distinction between primary and secondary causes. I think the primary and secondary causality, I think the failure to grasp this distinction is really one of the main reasons that some people see a conflict between religion and science. I believe this distinction is most simply explained by a simple analogy and by using the terms vertical cause and horizontal cause instead of primary and secondary. So the analogy is to a novel or a play. So consider the play Hamlet. In the play Hamlet, and I'm telling you this is true, the character Hamlet kills the character Polonius by stabbing him through a curtain. So consider the following question, and I sometimes hold a vote How, well, hold a vote. How many people think that Polonius dies in the play Hamlet because the character Hamlet stabs him through a curtain? Raise your hands if you think that. Okay. Well, you think I'm a liar, must many of you, because I told you that's what happens in the play. Uh, how many of you think that Polonius dies in the play Hamlet because Shakespeare wrote the play that way? Okay. See, it's absurd to think that there's a conflict or a, a, a contradiction between those two. Polonius dies both because Hamlet stabbed him and because Shakespeare wrote the play that way. 
There's absolutely no tension or contradiction there. The cause within the plot of the play, I'll call it the horizontal cause, is, is, is Hamlet stabbing Polonius. But Shakespeare, as the author of the play, is the cause of the whole shebang. He's the reason there is a play, that there are characters, Hamlet and Polonius. He's the cause of Ham ha the fact that Hamlet stabs Polonius and that Polonius dies as a consequence of that. He is, in fact, the cause of every event and character in the play and all the relationships among them, including the causal relationships among them within the play. So uh, theologians would not say horizontal cause, they would say secondary. So the causes within the plot of the universe, thinking of the universe as a great play or a novel, the causes within the plot, or what theologians call secondary causes, are the causes that we study. Scientists study, everybody studies. I put the match to the, to the fuse and the thing blew up. That's a natural chain of causes within the plot of the universe. God is the author of the universe, the author, and he is therefore the primary cause of everything. So it shows why it's absurd to put against each other the idea of God as creator and evolution. Did this species of animal, giraffes or crocodiles or whatever, did that species arise by some chain of natural causes? Or because God wrote the script of the universe that way? Both. Now, this makes clear also why scientific materialists are wrong to think that we believe in God without evidence. Now, for a materialist, evidence consists of what either you can directly sense or inferring the existence of something as the natural cause of what we observe, the way we see a compass needle move and we infer that there's a magnetic field as the natural cause of that motion. Now, God cannot be observed in either of these ways because he is, first of all, not a, an object within the natural world that could be sensed, nor is God a natural cause within the universe. God is not a cause within the universe. He is not a cause within nature. He is, a he is the cause of nature. And so nature gives evidence of God in the same way that a play or a novel gives evidence of its author, even if the author does not make an appearance within the novel. Okay, so now let me turn to history. So that's the end of, of philosophy and theology. Let's turn to the, the historical critique of religion. The idea that Christianity and perhaps the Catholic Church in particular opposed science and tried to hold it back is called by historians the conflict thesis. It's been rejected by contemporary historians of science as a recent invention. It really is an invention of the late 19th century. The idea that science was born in conflict with religion and that there were two warring camps, the science camp and the religion camp, is projecting onto the past ideas that arose, as I said, in the late 19th century. In the first few centuries of modern science, most, well, the scientific people and the religious people were the same people. Most of the great figures of the scientific revolution were religious. The scientific revolution is usually considered to have been sparked by Copernicus in the 1500s, but the actual revolution, the, the explosion, happened in the 1600s, the 17th century. So let's look at some of the, there's the conflict. The great figures, I, I'm not listing all of them, but these are some of the top uh, figure, the main figures of the scientific revolution. Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Descartes, Pascal, Boyle, and Newton. Copernicus was an official of the Catholic Church. Kepler was a devout Lutheran who announced one of his, who announced his discoveries with a prayer. I thank thee, Lord God, our creator, that you have allowed me to see 
the beauty in your work of creation. That was the attitude of scientists. They did not see their work as, as uh, attacking religion, but as manifesting God's glory, showing the glory and the beauty of his creation. Galileo, despite his troubles with the church, remained a devout Catholic throughout his life. Descartes believed in God and that human beings possess immaterial spiritual souls. And there's no reason to doubt his claim to be an Orthodox Catholic. Blaise Pascal was not only a mathematician and physicist of genius, but he was a religious mystic whose life had been transformed by a mystical experience and who wrote eloquently in defense of religious belief and against radical skepticism. Robert Boyle, the first modern chemist and founder of chemistry, was a pious Anglican who wrote theological works and left a large sum of money to endow a series of lectures whose purpose was to combat religious unbelief. And Isaac Newton, the greatest of them all, spent as much time on theological and scriptural study as he did on physics and mathematics. As I said, all of them saw their work as showing the beauty of God's creation rather than as supporting atheism. And this was true well beyond the 17th century. For example, most physicists would say that the two greatest physicists of the 19th century were Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell. And they were both deeply devout Protestants. Now, just to dramatize uh, the role of the Catholic Church has played in the history of science, I'm going to go through a litany, uh, not of saints, but of scientists, who are priests, who are Catholic priests. And they only have time to, name, to, to go through the, a few of the most outstanding. So from the 17th century, the century of the scientific revolution, I'll mention only Stenson, Mersenn, Shiner, Riccioli, Grimaldi, Castelli, and Cavalieri. Now, Neil Stenson, also known as Steno, a Latinized version of his name, is famous in three branches of science, anatomy, crystallography, and geology. He was considered the greatest anatomist of his time, and he made major discoveries about the glandular and lymphatic system as well as about the heart and the brain. But his greatest achievement was developing the correct theory of sedimentary rock and the origin of fossils, which unlocked the history of the Earth, and for which he is regarded as one of the principal founders of the science of geology. If you look up histories of geology, Steno or Stenson is usually listed first among the founders of this science. He left the study of science. He became a priest. He was a convert. He was raised, he was a Danish by birth and Lutheran by upbringing. He converted to Catholicism in, as an adult. He became a priest, eventually was made a bishop. He was known for his rigorous asceticism and concern for the poor, and he was declared blessed by Pope John Paul II. Marin Mersenne was a friar of the Minimite order. He's considered the founder of acoustics, the, for fundamental discoveries about the sound and vibrations. In fact, he was the first person to measure the speed of sound. He made important contributions to the theory and design of reflecting telescopes. His religious house became a meeting place of famous scientists. And his voluminous correspondence with other scientists was a crucial means by which scientists at that time learned of each other's work. This was before scientific conferences, before the internet, before scientific journals. Scientists learned of each other's work largely through correspondence and a central hub of that correspondence was Mersenne. The Dictionary of Scientific Biography calls him one of the architects of the European scientific community. Christoph Scheiner was a Jesuit astronomer, was uh, one of the discoverers of sunspots and he made the most detailed studies of them. And uh, here's a diagram from one of his, his very big treatise on sunspots. The diagrams are very much more artistic in those days. The Jesuit astronomer, another Jesuit astronomer, Giovanni Battista Riccioli, developed an extensive star catalog and together with his fellow Jesuit, Francesco Grimaldi, made the first map of the moon's surface. He developed 
methods for measuring time precisely in experiments and made the first, used these methods to make the first accurate measurements of the acceleration of gravity on the surface of the Earth. Recently, there was an article, a few years ago, there was an article in Physics Today point, pointing out that Riccioli actually discovered and analyzed what's called the Coriolis effect, an important effect in physics, 200 years before Coriolis did. Francesco Grimaldi, another Jesuit scientist of that time, discovered the extremely important physics phenomenon of the diffraction of light. Anybody who studies physics has heard of diffraction. This fundamental discovery shows that light is a wave, and since we now know, because of quantum mechanics, that all particles are waves, uh, diffraction is of central importance in many branches of physics. And I put up some pictures of diffraction phenomena uh, on the slide. The Benedictine priest, Benedetto Castelli, a friend and student of Galileo, did foundational work in hydraulics and fluid mechanics. His much more famous student, Torricelli, discovered the principle of the barometer. One of Ventura Cavalieri, another student of Castelli, was himself a priest, made important advances in the development of integral calculus. And I put a quote up from Leibniz. Calculus was discovered independently by Newton and Leibniz. And Leibniz himself pays tribute to uh, Cavalieri, uh, his con Cavalieri's contributions. Spallanzani, Lazzaro Spallanzani, is considered one of the greatest biologists of the 18th century. His contributions to biology are too numerous to mention. René Just Oui, who lived at the time of the French Revolution as a priest, was considered, is considered one of the founders of crystallography. In the 19th century, Father Giuseppe Piazzi made many contributions to astronomy, including discovering the first asteroid, which he named Ceres. And at, now Ceres has been upgraded to be considered a dwarf planet, which puts it on the same level as Pluto, which has been demoted to being a dwarf planet. Actually, they weren't called asteroids until much later. He, they were called planets back then. So he actually discovered one of the first planets uh, that was discovered in modern times. The Jesuit priest uh, Angelo Secchi is considered one of the main founders of modern astrophysics. Astronomy just studies where things are in the heavens, how they move. Astrophysics inquires about what these things are made of and how they work, what makes stars shine, and so forth. The, one of the chief tools that astrophysicists use to figure out what things are made of is spectroscopy, studying the spectra of the light that's, that is seen from these objects. Secchi pioneered the use of spectroscopy in, and uh, thus is one of the founders, as I said, of modern astrophysics. And he made the first classification of stars according to their spectra which is, in fact, the basis of the scheme of classification that scientists still use today. And a very beautiful symbol of the harmony of faith and science is that Secchi did much of his groundbreaking work using a t an observatory, a telescope, that he had built on the a roof of the Church of St. Ignatius in Rome. The observatory is no longer there, unfortunately. It was stolen by the Italian government at some point. The Czech priest, Bernard Bolzano, helped put modern mathematics on a more rigorous footing. He was a very important mathematician of the 19th century. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy called him an outstanding mathematician and possibly the greatest logician in the period from Leibniz to Frege, which is a 200-year period. Then, of course, the founder of genetics was the Austrian uh, friar, uh, Gregor Mendel. Well, this is for Notre Dame fans, so. Uh, and last but not least, <laughs> I'm not against Notre Dame fans, but this isn't Notre Dame, so I'm going to skip over that. Um, and last but not least, Georges Lemaitre, Lemaitre, or as most people call him, Lemaitre, uh, is, is a, was a Belgian priest and theoretical physicist who is considered the founder of the Big Bang Theory of the beginnings of the universe and its, and its development, the central idea of modern cosmology. So 
That's a pretty glorious, and this is just the priests. I'm not talking about the lay Catholic lay people. That's a pretty glorious record of achievement. The his, very well-known historian of science, Lawrence Principe of Johns Hopkins University, has written that, quote, the Catholic Church has been probably the largest single and longest term patron of science in history. All right, so that's enough history. Let's now turn to some physics, which is my favorite subject. And I'm going to tell you about a few discoveries of modern physics that seem more in line with the Christian view of the world than with materialism and atheism. For a more in-depth discussion, I refer you to my book, Modern Physics and Ancient Faith. And also, there'll be time in the Q&A to talk more about the physics. Now, one discovery of the 20th century has to do with the beginning of the universe. The Jewish and Christian view was, and is, that the universe had a temporal beginning, that it had a, a starting point a finite time ago. By contrast, the pagan philosophers of antiquity believed that the universe had always existed, Aristotle, for example. And most modern atheists have also seemed to prefer the idea that the universe is, as they say, past infinite, had no beginning, temporal beginning. Now, as of 100 years ago or more, let's say at the end of the 19th century, it seemed that the scientific evidence was pointing more towards the universe being past infinite and not having a beginning. And, sci and scientists began to believe that the universe was past infinite and to see the idea of a temporal beginning as a relic of religious superstition and creation myths and so on. But now we know that Georges Lemaitre's idea of a big bang was correct. There was a big bang about 14 billion years ago. In the standard theory of cosmology, that was the beginning of the universe, the beginning of space and of time itself. Now, it is quite possible that something preceded the Big Bang, that, the, that time extends farther back, that there's a prehistory, a pre-Big Bang history of the universe. We don't know and probably will not ever be able to know by observation. But there are strong theoretical arguments that favor the idea that the universe did have a temporal beginning, whether at the Big Bang or earlier, rather than that the universe is past infinite. Can't prove that, but that's where the weight of theoretical argument is. So in a sense, you chalk one up for the Jewish and Christian view of the cosmos. A second discovery has to do with our place in the universe. For a long time, atheists have said that the evidence shows that human beings are just a cosmic accident, a fluke in a universe that is totally without purpose. But over the last few decades, physicists have become increasingly aware that many features of the fundamental laws of physics are just right, or have seemed to be just right, to make the existence of life, such as ourselves, possible. If certain things had been even slightly different about the laws of physics, we wouldn't be here. These fortuitous features are sometimes called anthropic coincidences. Now, they suggest to many people that we aren't just an accident and that the universe does have a purpose and that part of that purpose is that beings like ourselves or complex life should evolve in it. One could mention many examples of such fortuitous or anthropic features of the laws and the, of physics and of the universe. For example, a very famous one, if the strong force, one of the four known forces of nature, the strong force is what holds atomic nuclei together. If the strong force were a little bit weaker, say 25 or 30 percent weaker, almost none of the elements of the periodic table would exist because a very crucial element called deuterium, the strong force wouldn't be able to hold it together and that would have had as a consequence almost none of the elements except hydrogen would have existed. And you can't make living things out of just hydrogen. The same is true, uh, another famous example, is that there's an energy level in the carbon-12 nucleus that's exactly at the right place. If it were higher or lower by only a percent or two, there'd be almost no carbon or any elements heavier than carbon in the universe. And again, that would have been disastrous for the possibility of life. The fact, but it's not just 
fine-tuned parameters, certain gross qualitative features of the universe are really important for the possibility of life. For example, the fact that we live in a three-dimensional world, that is a world with three extended large space dimensions, is crucial. The fact that the world is quantum mechanical is very important for the possibility of life. But a very interesting case is the size of the universe. Many people have seen the vastness of the universe compared to human scales as proving that we are insignificant in the cosmic scheme. Why did God create all that empty space? You know, we're just on this tiny blue dot. Clearly, we can't be that important. But actually, the vast size of the universe is a precondition for us being here. It takes billions of years for biological evolution to occur before human beings can make an appearance. Even before life began, it took billions of years of astrophysical processes to synthesize the chemical elements needed for life. So you need a universe to last billions of years. Now it turns out that Einstein's theory of gravity relates the longevity of a universe and its size. Suppose you said, God made a big mistake. He should have made a universe if we're the important beings, why didn't he just make a universe of human scale? Let's say the size of North America, okay? Well, if the universe had never gotten to be this bigger than North America, it would have lasted for about a hundredth of a second. And even if you allowed God to make a universe that say the size of the solar system, which is still vast compared to human scales, it would have only lasted for a matter of hours. If the universe is to last the billions of years that are needed for life to develop, it has to be billions of light years across, as it is. So it is a precondition. We would not be here if the universe were not so vast. A third development is that physicists have found that the laws of physics are based on very deep mathematical ideas. So I'll just illustrate that with an example. The laws of planetary motion that Kepler discovered 400 years ago are very beautiful mathematically, but it's not that deep mathematically. You can explain Kepler's laws to a, a grade school student in about 10 minutes. But Kepler's laws are really just the consequence of deeper laws, the deeper laws discovered by Newton, his laws of mechanics and gravity. To understand Newton's laws, you really have to know calculus. So now you're talking about maybe a college student or high school senior. But Newton's laws of gravity are really based on deeper laws. They're, they're, they're an approximation to deeper laws, namely Einstein's theory of gravity. Einstein's theory of gravity is based on non-Euclidean, curved, four-dimensional space-time. And to understand it, you really have to know tensor analysis and differential geometry and stuff like that. And usually that takes an entire semester to learn. And usually you learn it in graduate school, if, if at all. Because most physicists don't take it. You know, but, uh, but general relativity is now believed by the smartest people in my field not to be the ultimate theory, but to be actually a consequence of an even deeper theory, which is very probably what's called superstring theory. And superstring theory was discovered in the early 70s. And since 19, about 1984, actually 1984, hundreds and hundreds of the most brilliant mathematical physicists and mathematicians in the world have been intensively studying superstring theory. And they will tell you that they still don't really understand fully its mathematical structure. It's too deep. So doesn't that suggest, I mean, this universe is not put together with Legos or Tinker Toys. Its architecture is based on exceedingly deep ideas. And that suggests to some that a mind much greater than ours came up with those laws. The more, more deeply physics has probed the inner workings of the physical world, the more profound and intricate the mathematical structure it has uncovered. The great 20th century physicist Sir James Jeans remarked, the, the universe begins to look more like a great idea, like a great thought, he said, than a great machine. So I want to quote one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century who also did very important work in theoretical physics. His name was Hermann Weyl. 
And in 1932, he wrote, or gave a talk at Yale, a lecture at Yale, and he said this, many people think that modern science is far removed from God. I find, on the contrary, that it is much more difficult today for the knowing person to approach God from history, from the spiritual side of the world, and from morals. For there we encounter the suffering and evil in the world, which it is difficult to bring into harmony with an all-merciful and almighty God. In this domain, we have evidently not yet succeeded in raising the veil with which our human nature covers the essence of things. But in our knowledge of physical nature, we have penetrated so far that we can obtain a vision of the flawless harmony, which is in conformity with sublime reason. Now, I'm just going to say one more thing. Uh, I'm not going to go into the subject, but I was going to talk about quantum mechanics. But I just wanted to uh, summarize what I was going to say about quantum mechanics by saying that according to some very great scientists, quantum mechanics, one of the implications of quantum mechanics is that not everything is, can be described physically, that there's more to the reality than is, can be described by physics. It's kind of ironic. Here's really a very deep theory of physics telling us that not everything is physics. And the reason that people draw this, some people have drawn this conclusion is that physics, is describes, physics describes what can be observed and measured, but there has to be somebody doing the observations and measuring. In quantum mechanics, one talks about the physical system, that's being observed and measured, but one talks about the observer who's doing the measurements, and the mind of the observer plays a very crucial role in quantum mechanics. In fact, quantum mechanics is formulated, it's fundamentally about probabilities. Probabilities have to do, probabilities of events, which is what quantum mechanics is about, the probabilities of various events happening. Probabilities of, of events have to do with someone's state of knowledge or lack of knowledge. Before the election of 1864, it was just a matter of probabilities whether Lincoln would win. After people knew the result of the election, it was not a matter of probabilities anymore. So probabilities have to do with knowledge. Knowledge has to do with minds. That's how quantum mechanics ends up having implications about minds. So I'll just quote some famous physicists. Sir Rudolf Pirles, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, said, um, well, where does he say this? He says it here. The premise that you can describe a human being, including it, the whole function of a human being, including its knowledge and its consciousness, a funny choice of pronouns, but that's what he said, uh, its knowledge and its consciousness um, is untenable. The idea that you can physically describe everything about the human being, physically, is untenable. So, uh, Eugene P. Wigner, who was a Nobel Prize winner in physics, said that materialism, is inconsistent with present quantum mechanics. Now, the quantum mechanics we have today is the same as the quantum mechanics of his day and is the same as the quantum mechanics of the 1920s. Wigner says, flat out, materialism is inconsistent with quantum mechanics. And the philosopher of physics, Hans Halverson at Princeton, said, in the case of quantum mechanics, if one supposes physicalism or materialism, um, then one quickly lands in the measurement problem. That is, there's a very thorny problem that he thinks is unresolvable if you, if you assume physicalism. So there's a philosopher saying the same thing. Anyway, so I will stop there. I just want to say, conclude by saying, not only has Christianity, including the Catholic Church specifically, been a great friend of science and played a very positive role in its history, but the things discovered by science contrary to what many people think, have actually in many ways tended to agree with things we believe as Christians about the universe and about ourselves. Thank you. has agreed to take questions, but I ask you this. I want us to observe literally one minute of silence. 
deepen our gratitude, but to deepen our listening to our own questions and the conviction that this will make our questions deeper and our conversation richer. Let us begin. Thank you, and we now have some time for question and conversations. If you'll raise your hand, I have the microphone. Dr. Barr, you talked about um, Einstein's um, physics and that there's a more fundamental theory of physics being super string theory. My impression, I don't know a lot about it, but my impression is that with super string theory there's speculation of a multiverse. So does um, superstring theory lead to a multiverse? And then another question I have is, is a multiverse compatible with Christian belief? Because I know a lot of atheists seem to um, go to multiverse for explanations and to avoid God. Okay. A few things. First of all, I, I, it's not known whether superstring theory leads to a multiverse. First I should say what a multiverse is. A multiverse, as physicists think about it, is not many unrelated universes. It's a single universe which has many regions or, uh, let's say, many regions or domains. Okay? The simplest version of a multiverse, the, the, the most conservative version, is simply that the universe is enormously bigger than the part we can see because we have a limited horizon. We can't see farther than about 10 or 20 billion light years because light hasn't had time to get to us since the Big Bang from any farther away. So we have a horizon. So the multiverse idea is first, the universe is vastly bigger than the part we can see. And second, that some of the things that we used to think of uh, as constants of nature, as features of the natural world that are the same everywhere, actually vary from place to place. So that outside our horizon, the mass of the electron could be different, the strength of the strong force, and so on. Um, many, many things. And may, in fact, there could be even different forces and different particles. Now, deep down, another thing is the multiverse is not just, is not, not only is it one universe, as most people think about it, there is in a multiverse one common set of truly fundamental laws that govern the whole thing. The laws manifest them, would manifest themselves in different ways in different places. But the, deep down, there'd be the same set of mathematical rules everywhere. Okay, why, you say atheists invoke this to avoid God. That is true in the case of some atheists, but I do want to point out that the question of whether people like the multiverse idea or not is not, cuts across religious and atheist lines. I'm religious, I think the multiverse idea is very plausible, or some version of it. There are people who are uh, uh, atheists who hate the multiverse idea. In fact, the great majority of scientists, including the great majority of those who are atheists, hate the multiverse idea. So it's not an atheist plot. It, 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 it's, it's an idea that arose from sort of internal, as most scientific theories do. People were thinking about it for purely scientific reasons. Now, some, now why would this be of any, if, if, why do athe, some atheists like the multiverse idea? Well, as I said, there are features of the laws of physics which seem to be just right for making life possible. So let's take, I said, the strength of the strong force. It is, if it were weaker, we'd be in trouble. Actually, if it were also significantly stronger, we wouldn't be here, very likely. 
So the idea is, well, maybe the strong force varies in strength from place to place. So in different regions of the universe, in some regions it is weaker, others it is stronger. Uh, I talked about um, the energy level in the carbon-12 nucleus. Well, again, it's, it could be higher or lower in different parts of the universe. But if you have enough, if a big enough universe and these things are varying over a wide enough range, you're bound to find some region of the universe where they all are just right to make life possible. Okay, you buy enough lottery tickets, one's going to win. Now, okay, that might be the case. You know, we don't decide on what's true or false based on whether we like it or not. It's a, you know, it could be quite, but the thing is this, it doesn't undercut the idea that the universe's fundamental laws may have been crafted with the idea of life in mind. Because to have a multiverse, to have a universe that has this multiverse structure, the fundamental laws have to be very special. Not any old laws you would think up out of your head would give, you, give rise to a multiverse. So what my takeaway from all of this is that in one way or another, the laws of physics, the fundamental laws, have to be special if you want a universe with living things in it. They could either be special because certain parameters are, take very special values, or they could be special because they're the kind of laws that give you a multiverse. But you need, I think, it's hard to deny that, that um, the, law, the fundamental laws have to be special if you want a universe with life. And that's just, I think that's all you can say. But the multiverse itself is no threat to religion. There's no reason why God couldn't create a multiverse as well as any other kind of universe. Thank you, Dr. Barr. So at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that you're not aware of any scientific fact that's incompatible with Catholic faith or revealed doctrine. And in the course of the presentation, you also mentioned that it's a relatively recent scientific discovery of the temporal beginning of the universe. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, is there anything in the current trend of science honestly pursued which seems to be um, dissonant with Catholic understanding or Christian faith, especially that we as seminarians should be aware of or watch? I can't think of any. Um, I would simply say this. We, uh, I have a quote, but I don't have it with me from John Henry Newman. It's now St. John Henry Newman. I think it was to the effect that if, if scientists, and he said, you know, geologists and astronomers and ethnographers and whatever, if they announce that they've discovered something, or if it seems that they discovered something that, or they discover something that seems to be in conflict with the dogmas of the faith, we must believe either that, in fact, the claimed discovery is not true, or that it really is not inconsistent with the faith, or that if it is inconsistent, it is only with something that we thought was revealed, but that it actually is not a part of revelation. So we have to have that. Science follows a winding path. It ultimately leads to the truth. And that truth will be consistent with the Catholic faith. But it takes a winding path. And there are times when, in some areas of science, that path seems to be leading away from what we believe as Catholics. But we have to have the confidence, as people of faith, that, they'll be, that the road will bend back and eventually end up uh, with the conclusions that are consistent with the faith. And that's happened. I gave some examples where the universe had a beginning in time. A very big example, which I didn't mention, was the fact that before quantum mechanics, all the evidence seemed to show that the laws of physics were deterministic, meaning, and that's a characteristic of equations. All the equations of physics discovered up until the 1920s were deterministic. That means if you knew the state of the physical world at one time, the, the equations uniquely determined everything that would happen in the physical world after that, and indeed everything that had happened before that, which made it very hard to believe in free will. Whether I pick this up would have been determined by the state of the physical world billions of years ago through the equations of physics. Well. That was actually a huge problem for religious believers from the time of Newton onward, and led to a massive loss of faith. I think that was a, as big a contributor to the loss of faith as anything. But in the 20, 1920s, quantum mechanics came along and showed that the laws of physics, quite to everyone's surprise, 
are not deterministic. They don't tell you what's going to happen. They only tell you the probabilities of different things happening. So there's an example where the road seemed to be going one way, but then it twisted back. In fact, my book, Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, I go through five what I call twists in the plot, where it looked like science was going away from our, the picture of the world we have as, as religious believers. But in the 20th century, veered back, and it bring us, brings us closer to a view of things, is closer to the religious view. So we shouldn't live in fear, and I think many religious people live in fear, because they've been told that all the discoveries undermined faith, that there's going to be some big discovery next month or 10 years from now that's going to upset the apple cart. And, the, and unfortunately, a lot of the scientific press sort of feeds this kind of hype. You know, expect, expect the worst. You, know, it's going to, you shouldn't feel that way. It's not true that all the great discoveries have undermined religious tenets. Quite contrary, as I, I gave some examples. We should be confident. We shouldn't live in that kind of fear. We should be quite confident that science will not make such discoveries contrary to the faith. And as I said, I, I, right now, I can't think of anything, as you said, that's going in a direction that would be worrisome. But even if it were, I wouldn't be that worried. Thank you very much for your lecture. I wanted to ask about if you've encountered in your own life a conversion of a hardened atheistic scientist, materialist, who has come to the faith, and what might be in your understanding or your approach to it, some of the more convincing factors that could lead to such a conversion. Is it a theory? Is it a witness? Have you ever encountered something like that? Um, I don't know of people who are hardened atheists that have come to faith in my own personal experience. I mean, among scientists, I just haven't run into. I actually don't ask people a lot about their beliefs or lack of belief, so I don't know the inner thoughts of most of my colleagues. Um, there are two people on the board of the Society of Catholic Scientists. Here, I'll make a plug for the Society of Catholic Scientists. If you are a scientist who is Catholic or a graduate student or an undergraduate majoring in science, which includes mathematics, computer science, and some other things, uh, please consider joining the Society of Catholic Scientists. Uh, but on our board, we have seven scientists, including myself. Three of them are converts. Um, two are converts from a Jewish background. Um, one of those two, I'm not sure about the other, uh, our vice president, Jonathan Lunin, comes from a non-religious background. So he didn't come from hardened atheism, but he came from a non-religious background to become a Catholic. And uh, one of our other board members, Karen Oberg, actually her name is Swedish, and I'm, that's not how you actually pronounce it. I think it's Karin Uber. But anyway, Karen Oberg is what everyone calls her, and she uh, grew up in a nominally Lutheran uh, family not religious at all, and she converted, you know, six or seven years ago to become a Catholic, very on fire for the faith. Um, I don't think you're going to convert any hardened atheists by some argument. You can't, you don't argue people into the faith. I think what you can do is remove obstacles. There are people, what I, what I try to do in my book and what I think you can do, there are some things that people think are obstacles to belief and you can help remove the obstacles, but I don't think you can propel them <laughs> into religious belief by a syllogism. It's not the way to do it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Um, I'm coming from a different perspective here. Um, I am oh, there you are. I am the science department chair at DeSmet Jesuit High School, and so I'm surrounded by a lot of teenagers, teenage boys who are questioning faith, um, that seems to be the prime time to do that. And in, given our time of the retention of mission identity in our schools that call themselves Catholic, um, and in our own, you know, again, evangelization, um, propagation of faith, how does this look, you know, as a scientist, I'm a, I have, my training is, uh, I have a PhD in biology, so in biology, So you're it going does, to join the Society of Catholic Scientists? I, I, it's on the list. Unless you <laughs> promise right now to do that, I'm not going to answer your question. I, 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 <laughs> sign me up. Um, 
but but this is kind of a big deal for me. So um, it's it's easy for me to do that in biology where I see places for um, that crossover. For physics, um, where how do you throw this in there? To I mean, we have to cover content, yeah. but yet we are a Catholic school. So um, and mission identity is a large part of it. Knowing, loving, serving. So, um, how do you eliminate misconceptions? Um, given this audience, we're not talking quantum physics right. in high school um, or multiverse theory. So, what I are have, your suggestions? I have several suggestions. One, do you know of the program at the McGrath Institute for Church Life at Notre Dame? I do. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, there's a this there's a book. You know Christopher Baglow's text. Yes, I do. Okay. So I have nothing <laughs> yeah, to blue add. Text. Okay. So there's a book. Uh, the first ever and maybe the only extant book written as a textbook on science and faith for Catholic schools, which is at appropriate level for high schools, or for college for that matter, is written by Christopher Baglow, Chris Baglow, B-A-G-L-O-W. So it's about to come out in a second and much revised edition, so wait for a few months and buy it from Amazon. It's a terrific book. It's a brilliantly written book. Um, something for someone who has a short attention span, I wrote something which I think you can still get on the internet if you look hard enough. It's a pamphlet that was put out originally by Ignatius Press and the Catholic Truth Society, and I think it still exists. It's called, it has the same title as my talk here, Science and Religion, the Myth of Conflict, and you can read that in about two hours. And I wrote that as sort of my one-shot inoculation against scientific atheism, which I think if, if a high school student read that, I think that would go a great distance, clearing up a lot of misconceptions and preventing uh, a lot of mistakes. Um, how do you put it in the class? So those are the, my suggestions. Um, oh, and the McGrath Institute for Church Life, if you are teaching at a high school, a Catholic high school, um, look into their program, because they have these one-week summer, summer seminars for Catholic high school teachers and they bring in a trio, a, a, a religion teacher, a biology teacher, a physics teacher from each school if they can. And the, the week-long seminars where they study science faith questions so they can go back to their schools and, and be more knowledgeable in, about them. Um, in a physics class, you're right, you should, one should stick to the physics. That's my strong feeling. Is, But in a Catholic school, I, I think you can bring in religious ideas into the classroom. Um, one thing I would point out to them is that, uh, well, the point I made throughout my talk is that one of the strong arguments uh, in favor of an ex the existence of God is the orderliness of the universe. So I'm going to, oopsie daisy. Oh, ah, I don't seem to have it on this thing. Oh, well, I thought I had it on the, uh, well, I had, no, that's okay. I can't get back. But can you get it back? I thought it was the last slide. Oh, well. Um, I, I thought I had put on, but I, maybe I didn't. Um, or maybe it's on my thumb drive only, so maybe that's not worth doing. Um, yeah, I didn't put it on. One of the, 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 there are many, many statements by early Christian writers that it is the orderliness of nature that points to God. In fact, they sound like they're all uh, like a broken record. It's just, and all of them are saying the same thing. It's the orderliness of nature. I would ask the students to think about certain things. Why is the world an orderly place? Why are there laws of physics? The, the, all the atheists can do, all scientific explanations, and all physics explanations, all physics explanations, ultimately explaining phenomena uh, in terms of the laws of physics, and they explain laws of physics in terms of deeper laws. You're always tracing things to laws and to deeper and deeper laws. People in my field would say that once you know the ultimate laws of physics, and virtually everybody in my field believes that there are ultimate laws of physics, once you get there, you've finished. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's that you've gotten to the rock bottom of scientific explanation. Why? And I don't think many of them stop to think, why are there these fundamental laws? Why are there laws at all? And why are the laws so remarkably intricate and mathematically interesting? 
Those are questions I think the students can ponder. If they say, oh, but physics, science, physics can explain that. Physics can explain everything, in a sense, except why physics works. That is, why there are there laws of physics in the first place? And I think that you get them start thinking about questions like that. Um, anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, I need to bring our evening to a conclusion with four brief points. First, I'd ask uh, Archbishop Carlson and Father Mason to come forward for the bestowal of the Peter Richard Kenrick Medallion, which is both a memento of the evening and a token of our gratitude at Kenrick Glennon Seminary. Congratulations and thank you for thank a wonderful you. presentation. Thank you, Excellency. And uh, in the uh, tradition of uh, Archbishop Kenrick, who himself was uh, known as a great lecturer, you did a fantastic job. Oh, thank you. We're very pleased. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Second is just a reminder about the iTest webinar tomorrow is Evolution Catholic and uh, those brochures are in the back and a reminder about the gold mass tomorrow and those brochures are here in the front. Third, I just want you to know that Dr. Barr is going to retire from the University of Delaware in January. And I think this is a fitting occasion for us to express the gratitude not only of St. Louis, but of Catholics across the country, not only for this lecture tonight, but for all his work in the field of science and theology. We thank you, Dr. Steve Barr. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of Dr. Barr, for the gift of this evening, for the gift of removing the obstacles, removing the misconceptions of the conflict between faith and science, for equipping us in order that we may be bridges in this world with the, with the, with the belief of faith and science are compatible and ultimately lead us to you, God. I'd like to end this evening with the men singing Salve Regina. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcelo, Express Nostra Salve, A Te Clamamus, Exodus Filii, Lacrimarum.